Okay, uh, thank you guys for coming online to the New Genesis Group. Uh, we have uh, this amazing opportunity of uh, having Mr. William Gerdner, who is probably the most important conservative thinker and author. He wrote 13 books. He is an amazing guy, sensitive, full of care, and a man who actually, for me, is like a modern hero. So... Um, With much appreciation, I, I am very happy that you are able to speak to our Israeli audience and to bring some uh, important information and to make them realize what's really going on and how, how they should protect their families. And, uh, you know, the floor is yours. Please take us away and, you know, no politically yes. correct. <laughs> Thank you. No, there's no political correctness with me. <laughs> yeah, I think that happens to people when they get older. They just don't care much anymore about whether or not their opinions are acceptable to absolutely everybody. And uh, they follow my father's advice, which was uh, know what you think, <clears throat> say what you think, <clears throat> and do what you say. <clears throat> and that's what I tell my own children. Uh, so well, thank you for the introduction. It was way too kind. And I'm not sure I can live up to it. But uh, let's have a good time and go over the topic of uh, what I, what in 1990, I, well, it was actually a 1993 publication, but I was writing it by 1990, called The War Against the Family. Because it struck me at the time that um, this had deep roots uh, in the West and in the Western political and philosophical uh, tradition. So... I said about writing the book, and well, I'm going to show it to you. Now, this is the original book, uh, The War Against the Family. And if you can't read the subtitle, it says, A Parent Speaks Out on the Political, Economic, and Social Policies That Threaten Us All. Um, that was not an exaggeration then, and it's not <clears throat> an exaggeration now. Uh, because what I found out in doing uh, my research was that this, uh, what I call the anti-family tradition, and there's a, a chapter four in the book, uh, is called the anti-family tradition. It takes you through the roots and the thinking behind uh, significant figures of the Western world who came out against the whole idea of the family. In fact, be, uh, began to present it in their spoken and written work as the enemy of liberty, the enemy, enemy of political harmony, uh, as an element in class warfare, <clears throat> and all these things. So I just had to dig around and figure out how it started. Um, and the first thing I, I discovered was the anti-family sentiments in Plato's book called The Republic. Um, you know, Plato's whole idea He was living at a time of tremendous political unrest, and he was looking for a way to create the good society, which would do away with all the unrest that he and his predecessors had experienced. And he thought, he thought the natural family was, was a big part of that. Um, why? Because um, in the natural family is private. It, it, it uh, develops its own self regardless of uh, what the government is doing. Um, and the difficulty he had was that it's a creator of human differences and a perpetuator of human differences. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, some families are hardworking, some are lazy, some are smart, some are stupid, some are rich, some are poor, some are educated, some are not, and so on. So in his view, that's a recipe for creating an unstable world and um, well it's not certain how much he really stood behind the thing that he recommended on family policy in the Republic um, I'm just going to tell you what some of them were not all of them um, first of all he felt I think that um, all human wills should be subordinated to the will of the state uh, that's not so unusual over time although it comes as a bit of a surprise to our modern kind of more libertarian and uh, even classical liberal form of thinking. 
He also wanted to abolish all private property uh, because this is what makes some people rich and the absence of private property makes some people poor. So how is that good? How is that fair and all that? Let's abolish private property entirely, make it illegal. Um, but then he got even more radical. He wanted <clears throat> to abolish marriage and he wanted to uh, have all women, uh, as he put it, to be held in common by the community, which meant uh, anybody could have sex with anybody. Men could run around, I guess you'd say, fornicating with whoever. And uh, women would be held in common. Uh, they would not be what he felt would, were the slaves of their families or their ma the male, and uh, therefore would be, would be free. Um, and uh, he also wanted women to force women to lead the same kind of life as men in his community, even to the point of uh, engaging in active warfare alongside the men, uh, battle duty and all the rest of it. Um, marriage itself would be a forbidden institution. And here's the thing that got me <laughs> when I first started reading his thoughts. He said, no, no parent would know his child, nor child his parents. They would be raised by the community in a kind of national daycare setup, so raised by the state. Furthermore, he wanted to set up a selective breeding operation so that, um, you know, the um, unfit children or the weak children or the sick children or whatever uh, would be put out. It's what's called exposure. They would be laid out on the mountaintop somewhere, let the animals get them or the weather, cold weather kill them or whatever. Uh, so he, he wanted a selective um, breeding operation and even to have what he called mating festivals uh, in order to produce a superior race of uh, human beings. Euthanasia, he also recommended for defective human beings, the inferior and for their offspring. So <laughs> that's a pretty radical uh, program to begin um, our talk about the family in the Western, in the Western world. Um, but it, it's a program which I'm going to say by and large, not always 100%. But by and large has descended through time to our own era. And it got a push along the way. I mean, I'm skipping over 1500 years here, but it got a, a real push along the way uh, as far as Western, the Western democracies are concerned uh, in the 19th century when uh, Karl Marx and uh, Frederick Engels published this little book, uh, which is called A Manifesto of the Communist Party. I happen to be holding an 1888 English edition. It probably has some kind of value. I don't know, <laughs> but it is an original 1888 English edition. Um, and when I open it to one of his many comments about the family, here's what I read. The bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course when its complement vanishes. By the complement, he meant capital capitalist society. And both of these will vanish with the vanishing of capital itself. So there would be no capital. And by the way, I can't resist recommending to you that you reject the term capitalism just as I do, because the distinguishing fe feature of the Western democracies, the free societies of the world, is not capitalism. Everybody uses capital, especially governments. In my country, Canada, one of the largest, actually the largest uh, marketing and advertising budget in the whole nation is the federal, uh, the federal uh, government of Canada. <laughs> and they use our money, and you can call it, once we pay it, it's their capital, uh, to do those very kinds of things. No, the distinguishing, that's why I say reject the term, the distinguishing feature of the Western world and how it has formed such energetic and productive uh, nations is free enterprise. Both words are important. Free is the uh, first important word and enterprise is, is the next. Uh, I have five children and um, many of them at this very point in time are engaging in free enterprise, creating their own businesses, 
you know, which they hope will thrive. I mean, they're taking those chances, generating the uh, investment income to make it happen, doing all the planning, all the manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> um, because they're free and they're very enterprising. Um, so, and I want to just mention Engels. Engels uh, published this book um, after the manifesto of the Communist Party, and it's called The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. It had a tremendous influence on <clears throat> left Western intellectuals, especially of the leftist type, <laughs> which so many of them seem to be uh, these days. But if you open it almost anywhere, once he gets over his historical speculations, that is, you see this. The modern individual family is founded on the open or concealed domestic slavery of the wife. And modern society is a mass composed of these individual families as its molecules. So you can see the kind of physical metaphor he's using here. The family is the is the uh, is the. Uh, uh, kind of atom of the society's molecule, inside society's molecules. And um, that doesn't matter, but the long and short of it is he, he um, persisted in his attack on the family uh, all through that book. <clears throat> and he made a mark. Who did he make a mark upon? Well, a uh, modern leftist who we've come to know a lot about especially in the in the 20th century. Um, and I'm just going to um, talk to you a little bit more about that. I mean, you know, people like B.F. Skinner, H.G. Wells, Edward Bellamy, William Godwin uh, in the English tradition, people like that, who were pretty much miming or echoing <clears throat> these uh, sentiments from uh, the communist side of the ledger. Um, so really we haven't got a lot of time today so we have to kind of lead forward into um, the more recent um, and just as energetic people and movements which have attacked the idea of the private family especially for example in modern feminism so first wave Simone de Beauvoir you know Jean-Paul Sartre's mistress <laughs> who, by the way, at the end of, the, of her life, after uh, decades spent with Sartre, who did a lot of philandering, sexual philandering, uh, after he died and before she died, I'm almost on her deathbed, she said, basically, I was gypped. In other words, by her own attitudes, and she made those clear in a book of hers, which became quite well known, called The Second Sex, in which she defended uh, feminist principles uh, with a quasi existential bent and uh, but in the end she realized that she in fact had been chipped <laughs> Sard had gotten away with murder uh, and then we had a lot of Americans um, and it's always been a mystery to me here we have a group of kind of middle and upper class well, ed well educated women probably the best educated cohort of, of women in the entire history of the Western world, more of them, you know, okay, living mostly in suburbs and this and that, very safe in their little gated communities or wherever it is they happen to live, uh, looked after by husbands who who worked all day to provide for their families. And um, okay, so they were very happy when they came home dead tired and they got the uh, dressing gown and the slippers and the beer handed to them or whatever. But uh, these very, very comfortable, especially very intellectually oriented women uh, began to see this as a form of female slavery and, and started publishing books uh, about it. You know, the natural family is a patriarchy. It's a form of sexual slavery. Um, uh, and some of them called it a death penalty uh, for, for women. Um, and I'm moving forward now. Then in about the 1960s, when I was at Stanford University, we saw a lot, and this was just the transition time, we saw a lot of young students whom I later referred to as credit card hippies. <laughs> they were young people who were getting fired up with um, anti-social <clears throat> and anti-Western uh, philosophies uh, provoked um, by psychiatrists like 
R.D. Lang and, and others, and uh, political thinkers like uh, Herbert Marcuse, who uh, these people were touring around the Stanford campus from time to time, inflaming the young and making them feel that all Western society was jipping them. I even had a young fellow I, I ran with there because I was training at the time seriously for track and field and still competing. And um, he came up to me one day and, and invited me to for dinner at his house, his home, apartment, whatever it was. And he said, but he, he wouldn't get there till six o'clock because he was going to Safeway grocery store to steal a steak. <laughs> and I said, pardon? And he said, yeah, he said, these capitalists have been stealing from us. I'm just getting my own back. I'm going to take a steak and I'll see you at, at my apartment. You know, I was just floored and astonished by this attitude. But and I'm not going to say every student felt that way, but certainly the radical ones did. And they were part of a movement called Students for a Democratic Society or SDS. <clears throat> and a lot of their thinking is... Um, is still around. They wanted to bring down patriarchal society, bring down the concept of the natural family, bring down uh, private universities like Stanford, which had a board of governors, which were mostly drawn from the business community, like, you know, Hewlett Packard and company, big companies like that. And so you couldn't do much about this. It was an animus that was kind of planted in their young minds by their own professors. And many of them have graduated since, and they are now professors or became high school teachers or whatever. And they passed all this kind of thinking along. So make no mistake about it. We are living in an incredibly radical time in which we, it seems, we have forgotten our own uh, founding roots, of which the natural family was a great part, and are therefore vulnerable uh, to the teachings of these people. Um, Psychiatrists, for example, came into the forefront of the anti-family teaching. I already mentioned uh, R.D. Lang. Um, and again, as I say, they got these trends from ancient thinkers and more contemporary thinkers prior to them. The Platonists, as I said, were against property, against individual liberty, against the family, um, and so on. Um, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the period of Romanticism. He said, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. <laughs> this was a very powerful line to start your most famous book with, but it was a lie. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not born free. <laughs> in fact, we're born in chains, if you think about it, because we're 100% dependent as young babies. And we are going to die unless somebody looks after us for a long, long time. Uh, so, But he got away with it because the implication was that Free human beings were living in politically oppressive uh, societies, and the families was one of the biggest oppressors of all. Rousseau himself had a mistress for many, many years. He had five children with her. He refused to marry her, even though she pleaded with him, I guess, between each child. I don't know. And he ended up taking all five of his children to the local orphanage, where, as far as we know, they all died, uh, because historians have tried to find his progeny since, and no one ever has. So they're pretty certain that they died in these orphanages. So, you know, the man who was preaching universal love uh, didn't have much love himself for his own, uh, the mother of his own children, or for the children themselves. Uh, tenured radicals, I've already mentioned, um, and credit card hippies, therapists like R.D. Lang, um, you know, Lang described the psychiatric problems of modern young people as family problems. And he wrote a book called Knots, like the knots in a rope. So the idea was that a family forms knots of um, oppression and psychological interaction and dependency. And so if you go to a psychiatrist and you want individual therapy, he would say, oh, no, I have to see your whole family. Everybody has to come here because what you are suffering from is not just self or self generated. It comes out of the psychological complex called the private family. Uh, so, you know, people like him basically uh, came out with the notion that the family um, is a reflection of the violence in Western capitalist 
society itself. And that's why we have so many individual psychological problems. Um, uh, he wrote something called a May, he was part of something called a May Day Manifesto, which was a description. I mean, he signed it. Uh, it was against capitalism again, uh, that word, and uh, freedom. Um, and as I said, he told us, preached that there's no such thing as mental illness. Society itself is sick. And, uh, and then he said, this is important, that psychiatry as a profession is, and I'm quoting, is concerned with the politics of liberation, unquote. So this is the kind of theme that we get, and it runs all through, all through Western society, and I would say to a damaging extent, in the sense that today, I have wonderful young people in my own family who have some of this attitude. They think that liberty, for example, is some kind of human quality that it somehow resides within each human being as a sort of essence. Uh, and it needs to be defended by any means. And I'm more a follower of philosophers like David Hume, who said, no, f uh, liberty is, is not an essence or a quality of a human being. It's a practice and a tradition of a law-abiding society and in which the main, the most important thing is not the liberty, which is assumed to be important, but what he called the equal restraint of all. That's a, that's a phrase that Burke echoed later in his work. The, 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 an equal restraint of all citizens is what guarantees their liberty as a practice. Uh, so citizens do not get to choose um, which motives justify rebellion against the government, you know, because you're going to choose one thing, I'm going to choose another, and the whole thing is going to go down in chaos. I mean, there's some point at which all human beings would resist would resist government oppression, or should. But until that point is reached, and it's not quite clear where that point is, uh, we can't have a hold a society together in which everybody is banging the drum uh, for their kind of liberty, but not necessarily the other guy's kind of liberty. And that's a theme we can come back to uh, some other time. At any rate. Here's another phrase that um, that R.D. Lang used. I make it hardly believe it. He said, our own cities, our families, our schools, and our churches are the slaughterhouses of our children, unquote. And his student, a guy named David Cooper, he said, quote, the initial act of violence against the average child is the mother's first kiss, unquote. In other words, as children, we are seduced into our system by the charms of our own mothers. Um, so this was kind of the thinking from the psychiatric point of view. The political, I've already mentioned, um, it's now gone through how many waves? I don't know. People talk about fourth wave feminism and all that kind of thing. If you actually go get a copy of War Against the Family, you'll see all of this spelled out. It's a five or six hundred page book. I had tears rolling down my cheeks in many of the chapters um, which deal with the history of the anti-family movement, with the anti-family tradition itself, with the pro-family tradition, and then with all the other uh, subjects have their own individual chapters, like uh, what the feminists are really up to, what the abortion movement is up to, what the euthanasia movement is up to, what the homosexual movement is up to. All of these in the kind of anti-family context. And I'm afraid that each one of those chapters <laughs> would take at least an hour uh, to explain. Um, but let me now just just touch on some of the anti-family weapons, uh, which have been developed by Western uh, populations themselves. Not the populations as a whole, of course, but by the radical elements um, within them. All societies have radical elements, it seems and ours are no exception. How they get away with so much, I'm not sure. There's also a chapter in the War Against the Family on the Swedish example. And um, I remember um, uh, when one of the Swedish uh, activists uh, who was incredibly energetic in converting Sweden, 
from a highly traditional, highly family-based society, beginning about the 1930s, 40s, and so on, um, she and her husband and many, uh, a few others, maybe five people, set about converting Sweden into the most radical liberal democracy of the Western world, which became, by the way, um, a model for countries like Canada. Because I remember when our own Prime Minister Trudeau, the father of the high school actor, teacher that we have as a Prime Minister now, uh, the father was a lot brighter than him, but um, he knew what effect a Prime Minister could have on the development of a nation. And when he was walking around with his um, Minister of Justice one day, he said, well, we're not going to go the communist way even though he liked communism, he likes radical socialism. He said, we're not going to go the communist way and we're not going to go the American greedy capitalist way, which was the adjective that people like him always attached to what they called capitalism because they were not free enterprise people themselves. I mean, Trudeau wouldn't know how to make a, a, a pie and how to sell it. <laughs> he had no idea uh, how to do anything in the free market. And he never existed in one or lived in one, but he lived off the um, the um, wealth created in the free enterprise society by his own family. So he said, we're not going to do the communist way. We're not going to do the greedy capitalist way. We're going to go the middle way. And by the middle way, he meant the Swedish way. And you really have to read that chapter in the war against the family to see, <clears throat> to see what they did. Gunnar Myrdal won the Nobel Prize in economics and his, and his wife Alva was the one most most involved in the radicalization of Sweden, which used to be, as I say, a highly traditionalist um, pro-family society and ended up as a highly radical uh, anti-private family society where, you know, everything is stratified. You know, the children get government daycare, then they go to government schools, and then they get government housing for young married couples. Uh, and in some of those housing developments, by the way, I'm not saying all of them, and Sweden itself has changed in recent times because they've suffered a lot of disappointment from this uh, scheme of theirs. In some of those developments, they were actually built uh, on government instructions that they have no dining rooms. In other words, a family apartment would have no place to eat. What the whole apartment complex would have would be a common dining room for everybody in the apartment complex. So when time came to eat, you'd all go to the common dining room, like some kind of cafeteria, in other words, you'd be forced to eat together, forced to eat with other people, which they thought would help to um, dissolve uh, the natural family ties and convert them to, to what? To allegiance to the state, allegiance to the government and the government's idea of, of what the best way to live is. So you'll find that outlined in my chapter on the Swedish experiment and the... Um, nasty consequences of all that. But anyway, what I was getting at was, I think it was Alva herself who said it was shocking how few people it took to radicalize an entire society. I think she said half a dozen, half a dozen people who can get a hold of the microphones, who can dominate the uh, productions of the press in writing about these things, and who can teach in the universities and the schools. Or, you know, or, for example, uh, in Canada, as I say, in my, my province, it's called Ontario. There's 13 million people here. We have something called the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. It, it's actually an institute for the production of extremely radical teachers. I, I know that firsthand because my daughter went there. Uh, when she wanted to be a teacher, she was required to go to, we call it OISE. That's the, the acronym, O-I-S-E. She was required to go there for eight months or whatever to get her teaching certificate. So she went. And uh, in the first few weeks, she was just shocked to see how much uh, of the teaching from the radicals there was anti-family. And um, so she stood up and objected to some of this. And this caused such a furor, you would hardly believe it. First of all, among the teachers themselves, one of whom I have to say was honest enough to take her aside afterwards. And he said, I admire your courage. He said, that was tough at what you did. But more to the point, she was swarmed by students who felt the same way, but hadn't had the guts to say anything. 
And uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was she said. I wish I did. I had it on my tongue, but I don't. At any rate, uh, what I do remember is she told me that sitting beside her was a elderly gentleman. I mean, she was 25 at the time, so this elderly gentleman was probably in his 50s. And he wanted to be a teacher in Canada, too. But he had escaped communism in Romania, and he came to Canada as a new citizen. And he turned to my daughter And here's, he tapped her on the shoulder, and here's what he said. Her name is Ruth Ann, <laughs> a beautiful name. And he said, Ruth Ann. <laughs> he mispronounced it, but he said, Ruth Ann. He said, shut up. She said, pardon? He said, shut up. He said, this is exactly what happened in my country. Word for word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence. We went through all this kind of thinking about uh, the family and about radical leftist views. Just shut up. He said, when I left Romania, I had done a translation of George Orwell's small novel called Animal Farm, which, of course, is a kind of metaphorical attack on socialism. He said, I was chased out of my country with the sound of machine guns at my back. That was the message that he gave her, and she never forgot it. At any rate, I, I, anyway, I tell you this story just to say that This was all rooted in attacks on the private family because Western leftism backslash liberalism uh, is no longer what I call classical lib liberalism. It's leftist liberalism, quasi-socialism, and so on and so on, um, is, is, goes right to the heart of the matter, which is how you generate free individuals is in free private families. You simply can't do it in a government entity or government organization where the whole emphasis is on collectivism and not on the generation of individual uh, personality and individual initiative. <laughs> so anyway, I'm wondering a bit, but... William, um, William, if yeah. I may ask a question, uh, in your uh, research, did you recognize any invisible hand or orchestrated efforts by people of interest to generate this attack on our families because it seems like it's, <laughs> it's everywhere already and it's unstoppable or do you recognize it more like an organic process of decay because of uh, urbanizing the way we organize ourselves the the modern world and uh, the, the um, um, the distance that we took from the traditions and religions of the West w How do you see that? Because I have the feeling that if we look at Aplaton, Plato, and we go all the way to different philosophers through time, it seems like they had an agenda and it was extremely important for them to push it as part of their controlling mechanism. And uh, like you said, to promote collectivism, state of mind in, and, and the destruction of the individual freedom. So I would like to hear what, what do you see? It's a great question, and I think you've actually answered it for me. But I'll just say, I think part two of what you said is true. Uh, in other words, I've learned this myself. It's possible to have an orchestra playing the same piece, but no conductor. It's possible. However, in the Western world, I would say the original conductors were people like Plato, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, and then all the way up through the line of radicals, which I talk about in my book and explain quite clearly what they were up to. But in the society at large, uh, in other words, I guess what you'd say is those instigators, they create waves, kind of psychological and political waves, which roll like a tsunami over the mass of the people. And by the time the wave hits you, you don't see anybody as a conductor of the um, or generator of the wave or the political orchestra. Everybody seems to believe it. This is going on now in our very midst. Um, this EDI thing, what people here call equity, diversity, and inclusion, is another movement of the radical left to restructure traditional uh, meritocratic society. Uh, I happen to be very much involved in the fight against it myself. because I'm a director of a family foundation called the Gardner Foundation, which my grandfather created 60 years ago. I don't want to do an advertisement here, but it's an important uh, foundation because for 60 years, it's been giving 
sizable um, financial awards to the world's finest biomedical scientists. Every year we give out awards. Maybe now it's about five every year, I think. And uh, these winners of the Gardner Foundation Award get a check handed to them with no conditions on it for $100,000 each. <laughs> Pretty good. But And for all those years, the whole principle of the foundation was it would be an award for the world's finest biomedical uh, research and science dedicated to the relief of human suffering. Now, so happens that foundation has given its award to over 400 winners in the 60 years. And over 100 of them, I'm pretty proud of this, have afterwards won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. <laughs> it's a great record. But recently, and this is because of the recent president and because of what she perceives of the times, um, the foundation has been infiltrated by something called EDI. I, I don't know if it exists in Israel, but it's going to. It's everywhere in the West now. This is the radical social justice warriors campaigning for what they call equity, diversity, and inclusion. Now, all those words are loaded. For example, equity <laughs> is a, doesn't mean equality. <laughs> equality is about equal shares of something, no matter what it is. For example, a parent like me who has five kids, I'm going to use the principle of equality when I die and leave my children money because they're all good kids. But if one of them was a terrible kid and turned against the family or against uh, his or her siblings, I would use, in his case, the principle of equity, which is about what is deserved, not about equality. Uh, so these people in their public phrasing of this campaign against the liberties of the West in EDI uh, talk about equity. And the reason is they see the whole world in kind of quasi-Marxist terms as divided into classes of oppressors and oppressed. And of course, the oppressors, we either, we either know them in actuality because they're out there. You know, they're capitalists, they're patriarchal men, they're men in men period, they're white people, they're whatever they are. And corresponding to them, we have a class of the oppressed. And the oppressed people deserve equity meaning, you know, they deserve reparations. They have to be paid back for all the terrible treatment that they have received at the hands of the first class. And this is the kind of thinking which is in the air everywhere now, even in the Gardner Foundation. And I've been trying to fight it and I, I have lost. In fact, I lost today because today I got an answer to my request to sit with the chairwoman of the foundation. Nice woman, actually, but she doesn't see the politics of it. None of the people on the board could really see it. Well, I shouldn't say none. Maybe half of them saw it, but the other half didn't. And um, I said, look, you're politicizing a meritocratic foundation. The standard since my grandfather created it was simply merit. We don't care if it's all white men, all white women, all black men, all black women. <laughs> we don't care who they are, as long as what they're doing is the best medical science in the world. Now it's all about, you know, it's going to be about balance, you know. And I have warned the foundation. I said, they said, well, we're just applying these ideas to the nomination process. We want to get more nominations from oppressed groups, uh, social groups that we haven't heard from before, genders, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. So I said, well, if you think you're going to restrict it to the nomination process, you better think again, because you're going to end up with winners. And one day, just suppose you have five white males as winners. Somebody in the organization is going to have to say, we can't do this. Pardon? We can't do this. We can't tell the public that we've got five male winners. We have to get rid of some of these winners and get some women in or get some homosexuals in or get some black people or some Quebecois in the case of Canada, some French speaking people. Uh, but see what I'm saying? In other words, it's a direct attack on the pure merit, meritocracy of that foundation. You can't change this thinking. Believe me, I have tried in the most eloquent way that I know of. And even if I sit down with some of them and I say, do you know that almost 26% of the winners of the Gardner Foundation for the last 60 years have been Jewish males? And are you telling me that there's something wrong with that, that they didn't actually deserve it? Are you th throwing all our past winners under the bus 
because there were too many of them from one group and not enough from another, you know, that kind of thing. Well, they just go silent. Uh, they don't think they're going to be facing these problems, <laughs> but I do. And that's why I'm resigning uh, tomorrow because I can't, I can't put my name on a organization which has in fact become political and they just don't see it and there's no conductor of the orchestra they think they're doing wonderfully generous things in helping to spread the glory of the award to all classes of people and all genders plural and all the rest of it and i say no no you're heading for trouble here it's interesting because if you actually confront them with the facts of life for example uh, Toronto's back basketball team, you might as well call it Canada's basketball team, called the Toronto Raptors. They won the NBA two years ago. About a million people came out and clapped and celebrated when they did that. Every player on the team is a black man. And there are no Canadians. There are no Canadians on this team. They're all black. Everybody was happy. They were cheering because they're fantastic basketball players. So I said to the chairman of the foundation, chairwoman, I had said, what do you think of that? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do you rationalize having uh, 35 black men on Canada's NBA championship basketball team and nobody else, no other colors, no other genders, no other whatever? Uh, they just kind of go away uh, because they can't answer it. Uh, the same is true in track and field with, with my sport. When I began running, we had a man named Harry Jerome. He was a black runner from Vancouver. He was terrific. He won a silver, a gold, a bronze medal rather, in the Olympic Games that I was in in 1964 in Tokyo. And uh, then he died young, unfortunately, but not because of that. But um, you didn't see many other black runners, at least in a country like Canada. Now, every time Canada's very successful national relay teams come up in the television, they're all black men. But nobody's saying, you can't do that. We need some white people on this team or we need some short people or some taller people or whatever it is that they think would be more representative of what? Of what? Of the egalitarian society that they have in mind. Now, this is the operating principle which is undermining the West. The idea that all people are equal, all races are equal, all classes are equal, all ethnicities are equal, blah, 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 blah. And of course, we all know that it's not true. But no one's going to say that in public. Uh, for example, the doctor who did the operation on my shoulder. He was he used to go to the University of Toronto. That's where he graduated. And he said, Bill, you know what? He said, if you go to Robarts Library, which is a big, impressive library at the University of Toronto, at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, he said, you're only going to see Asians there, Asian students. You won't see any white people, any black people, any coffee-colored people, nobody but Asians at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. Everybody else is out partying. Now, you could say they're living a more balanced life. They're not just, you know, locked in their books and doing only that. <laughs> I should share again the story I, I shared with uh, Harry and his people before. Um, we have a private school not far from us, which has become primarily Asian over the last 25 years. When our kids went there, it wasn't. It was probably a mix, mostly Caucasian, some Asians, you know, some Jewish kids, whatever. I don't know what the mix was, but it was primarily, you know, that kind of school. And now it's almost, well, it is majority uh, Chinese in particular, you know, some Korean, some Japanese, but mostly Chinese-based students. And when you walk around the school, you can hear them speaking Chinese in the hallways. And uh, that school used to pride itself on developing well-rounded students. Sports was a big deal. It's like the English tradition was that the, you know, the battles of World War I were actually won on the rugby fields of Eton, Eton University, you know, that kind of thing. That idea that a well-rounded individual is more important than a purely smart individual. And if they're not well-rounded, uh, they're really living with a kind of hand handicap. Uh, they're intellectual cripples or moral cripples because they haven't really had a full development. That philosophy used to underlie all Western private schools as distinct from government schools, which never used to pay much attention to it because they were government schools and the parents really had no influence 
on the doctrines of the school. Uh, the entity that really had the influence, the conductor of that orchestra, if you like, was the state because they were state funded. So in a public school, when a parent who was upset with the school came in and complained to the principal, what did they get? A very professional, very sweet, very pleasant, to hell with you, uh, without saying it in so many words. Oh yes, no, we'll look after it. Oh yes, we realize that's a problem and so on. But once the parent leaves, it pretty much goes on as it always has. Why? Because the structure of the school in itself is supported by the government, not by the parents. So the whole purpose behind the private school is to change the paymaster of the schools from the government to the parents. Because in private schools, when a parent goes in to teach, speak to the headmaster, um, uh, it's taken much more seriously. They listen because they realize that at $20,000 a year in tuition, if you're really unhappy, they may be saying goodbye to that $20,000. If you have five kids in there, it's 100000 So the paymaster is now the parents, not the government. And they really get their ear. I mean, if it's going to be a change at all, that's how it happens. William, I would like to inform you. I, I'm, sh I'm sure you're going to be really excited that in Israel, ne starting next year, uh, there will be sexual education, 10 hours a year for the students here in Israel. So what are you going to say to our parents about that? And second, just a shorter question. How many sexes do you know and what is gender? <laughs> well, that's a trick question, as you know. Um, you can't do... anything about your biological sex or gender it's what you're born with so you can call yourself what you want um, a girl who calls herself a boy um, this is a fantasy and I'll tell you what really irks me uh, is that everybody's going along with it it's a form of public cowardice for example uh, when I was doing commentary on the Olympic Games in Montreal in 76 for a national broadcasting company company called the CBC. One of the most amazing athletes there was Bruce Jenner. And Bruce won the decathlon gold medal and a hell of a performance. And then later, this is like four years ago, whatever it was, he decided he wanted to be a woman. And uh, he transitioned, as the phrase goes, started taking drugs, hormones, whatever it is. And now he's walking around with long hair and lipstick and fake boobs and all the rest of it and calling himself with a female name. Well, he can call himself what he wants, but I don't understand why the newspapers and the television networks and the politicians refer to him as she, because obviously there's no she there. It's still Bruce. He's just masquerading as, as a woman. And why do I say it's bizarre is because this psychology and Israel's going to get it in the sex ed, believe me. Uh, I have a whole chapter on sex ed in the school's And uh, you'll see a video about that on my website. It's pretty devastating, the kinds of materials and books, and I'm not going to call it philosophy, which they're downloading into these children's minds. At any rate, um, yeah, so Israel's going to see all this stuff. It's all going to be leftist propaganda, you know, in which uh, little books like Susie Has Two Mothers and all that kind of stuff, they're going to come home with those kind of books. And if you're a parent, you're going to be saying, you know, what the hell is this? What do you mean, two mothers? Uh, nobody can have two mothers and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, back to the guy who thinks he's a woman when he's actually a man like Bruce. Here's my point. If he walked around and he said, my name is Louis Napoleon. Do you think the newspaper in Canada or Israel or anywhere else would call him Louis Napoleon? I mean, I don't. Uh, or if he said, I'm Jesus Christ, would they call him Jesus Christ? No, they would laugh. They would say, you, that's ridiculous. Go away. You know, call yourself what you want, but we're not going to, we're not going to be complicit in that self-deception. So if that's true, why are they complicit in the self-deception about the sex that he says that he is? If anybody can answer that, I'd love to hear it. I think it's a profound capitulation of... ideological capitulation of the West to what? Here's my answer. And you won't find this answer with many other people. The answer is lies in the Western fascination 
with what I call the hegemony of the will. What do I mean by that? Well, sovereignty uh, is a concept we need to think about because it has changed over time. It used, you know, centuries ago, the, the sovereignty of God was not questioned. You know, and then it became the sovereignty of the king or the queen or whatever, of the monarch, or the head of the state had sovereignty, even they had to you know, watch their P's and Q's with respect to the will of God. But they also had a kind of sovereignty. It was coming down from absolute sovereignty of God to sovereignty of the monarch, too. And then as monarchy kind of got weaker, it became sovereignty of who? Of aristocrats, uh, sovereignty of important people in society. Now they were calling the shots. Uh, what's one of the manifestations of this? Well. The House of Lords in England, for example, which has a sort of mm, assumed <clears throat> intellectual and moral sovereignty, even over its own parliament or House of Commons. Same in Canada, which duplicate has duplicate, duplicated what's called the Westminster system. The House of Lords had sovereignty. And then it kind of came down to parliament. And, you know, we need to we need to have an elected House of Lords. Get rid of these people because they're just getting in what they're getting in our way getting in the way of our will as expressed through our elected representatives. You see, you see what I'm saying? So sovereignty is coming down, 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 even to the point where we want to get rid of the House of Lords or what we in Canada call the unelected Senate. How do they want to get rid of it? Well, they want to start by making it elective. We've got to make it democratic. Why? Because dem democracy is about the will of the majority. And we can't, even though more senators may vote for something than others, whose will do they represent? Not mine, not yours, just their own, right? So the whole assumption that they were wiser, better educated, more cultured, uh, you know, smarter people, that's all gone by the wayside. It got politicized. You know, prime ministers started putting big, big name hockey players in the Senate or, you know, that kind of thing. Their favorite whatever became senators. And so the idea that there was a kind of a filtration of opinion going on, that we were filtering political reality so that we got the very best minds in the upper chamber. And then in the lower chamber, we would have parliamentarians dealing with what? With pandemonium, with public outrage, with the will of the public and all those cries for this and cries for that. But, you know, we weren't going to be pushed around by our own parliamentary democracy. Why? Because we had unelected senators who could go tut tut. We're going to send that law back to you. It's it's imperfect. You have to rethink this issue. In other words, the Senate was a what we call a chamber of sober second thought. It was a great phrase, <laughs> but now it's no longer second thought and it's no longer sober. So the Senate has kind of lost its utility in the West as sovereignty proceeds downward. Well, then it was just parliament, just the will of the people. Who's voting for who? Who's got the majority? And, you know, it's disgusting that sometimes we have a political party which doesn't have a majority of the people. We call it a minority government in the first past the post system. How can we have a minority government when you don't have a, when you don't have a majority, you don't have a democracy? So there's infatuation with things here, which accompanies this, I call it the descent of sovereignty over time. There's a fascination which takes place with it, which is how democratic is it, this idea of sovereignty? And if it's not, it's going to come in for criticism, because if it's not democratic, how can it be sovereignty? You know, that kind of question. Uh, well, people completely forget their history. <laughs> they forget the fact that, at least in North America, and I, I know in England too, um, there was tremendous suspicion about democracy as a form of government for centuries. A lot of that because of the crazy experience the Greeks had when Plato was around. And then afterwards, and I think so-called democracy lasted in ancient Greece for about 170 years on and off. Once they actually voted it out democratically, they wanted their aristocracy back. And then they voted it in again, whatever, or rammed it down the throats of the people. But uh, about 170 years, you know, that's the longest any democracy ever lasted until the American one came along, which I think now is the longest lasting democratic system. But even that is not democratic. The American founders, James James Madison, 
and all those folks who wrote that wonderful book <coughs> um, about politics when, uh, when they before the Constitution uh, became a reality uh, wrote against the democratic principle. Uh, they wanted to bring in checks and balances to make pure will of the people impossible. How? Uh, unelected Senate. It eventually became elected, but then it was unelected. And um, and the various uh, houses that they had, the Senate, the, uh, the Congress, and then the, uh, I forget the name of the other chamber they used during their elections, which says go so much less. Why? Because it's not democratic. You know? So democracy has become a big deal in modern times, hand in hand with the descent of sovereignty over time. To what point has sovereignty descended? Now I'm getting to the reason I raised this issue in the first place, into you and me. Sovereignty is now considered um, an aspect or a quality of individuals living in free societies. This is where <coughs> this is where democracy resides. Uh, and what's the consequence of that? <coughs> the increased importance of the human will. So you get things like this Roe versus Wade abortion um, fracas in the U.S. where Roe versus Wade, I should say, was finally uh, nullified because it never should have been the law in the first place because abortion is not mentioned in the American Constitution. They just read it in as if it were mentioned. So it was a lie to begin with. But having said that, the fuss about it uh, is really about my choice, my body. And, and the idea is my choice is sovereign. If I choose something, that makes it right. But of course, when I say to women who are doing this, I say, choosing something doesn't make it right. What do you mean? I said, well, people choose evil things all the time, bad things. And they also choose some good things. But you can't evaluate a situation just on the fact that they're choosing it. You have to evaluate on the basis of what they're choosing, you know, in the whole context of how we live. And they don't know what to say because they haven't thought about that. Oh, dear, you know, because you suddenly undermine what? You under uh, undermine the idea that the human will is sovereign in everything that is decided by an individual. This is a long way of answering whatever whatever the question yeah. was from this William, point. Uh, I, I would like to suggest a connection and to see if you, what is your opinion about it, uh, about this pure will that is char characterizing the West, especially. And uh, I, I find that uh, pure will in Gnostic philosophies, um, you know, Gnostic uh, movements, even in the Middle Ages. And uh, I, I find it interesting that there is like some kind of battle between the restrained individual under the law, under a moral objective uh, and absolutes, and, and the emphasis on will. And when people are focusing on will, eventually they will become a servant of their own vices. And, you know, they are going to keep themselves away from uh, that objective from moral. Control. Excuse me? Away from any con external control. Yeah. So yeah. Do, do you agree with that? Or do you see a connection to the Gnostic movement? Um, yes, because, for example, I, I know... Can you can you tell us a little about that, please? I will try. Uh, maybe you should be giving this lecture instead of me. I like what you said. <laughs> It's true uh, what you said. Uh, um, but perhaps I could recharacterize a bit of it uh, because we did a session, you and I, on the Gnosticism, and I have a video on my website about it, and I think it's a fairly good presentation of that phenomenon. So in, in Gnosticism, it wasn't just the will. It was the will. Uh, which um, <clears throat> which they wanted to be, I hate the word hegemonic, I guess dominant is an equivalent word in English. They wanted the will to be sovereign, okay, over everything. But mostly because they had a, they despised this world and they wanted out of it. Uh, we went through that before. They saw the world outside this earth uh, as having a kind of perfection which could never be here. Um, and so, yes, um, the human will was part of their movement, but it wasn't central to it. But here now, now in this very moment in time, the will is central to everything that we see politically. It's people demanding, when they say liberty, 
they they mean my will. I want my will expressed. Uh, for example, the recent uh, so-called freedom convoy in Canada. <laughs> I have disagreements with a lot of my friends, wh whom I don't think uh, are actually seeing what was actually happening. All they saw was cries for freedom. And if you cry freedom anywhere in Canada today, you're going to get attention. And people are going to think that whatever it is you want is something important. <laughs> and that freedom is important. But of course, freedom is unimportant unless it's surrounded in the context of law. Because freedom without law is just anarchy. It's doing whatever you want. It's the total hegemony of, of the will. <laughs> and in a democratic system, um, what you end up with, and there was an image about this, you know, in Canada, we have dog sleds up in the north. You you get about eight or nine husky dogs and you tether them to the sled and to each other. And they pull the sled for hours at a time. And it's great fun. You can go for a kind of a sled ride uh, with these huskies pulling you through the winter on the trails. They're great fun. But the image that the critic of uh, these kinds of uh, societies, which are only concerned about the word freedom without any context, he said, he said, it's like a bunch of dogs tied to the sled, but not to each other. And they run in all directions at the same time. So you can see the consequence of that is complete paralysis, if not dogs actually fighting and trying to eat each other, which is not just a metaphor in the sense that in modern societies where everybody's running in different directions, we are trying to eat each other metaphorically, okay? Uh, defeat, defeat each other morally, physically. And there's been a whole movement of the idea of what is right and what is wrong into the individual. Um, so I wrote a book about this. And again, this is flagrant self-promotion called The Book of Absolutes because I was really annoyed when I went to a social gathering. I didn't know a lot of people say and I tried to strike up a conversation with some fellow and I would say something I thought was indubitable. It could not be contradicted. Well, let's see what he has to say. So I say it and he looks at me right in the eye and he says, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. And I said, well, it can't be true and false at the same time. One of us must be wrong. And this is my invitation to debate it a little bit informally. Let's have a good time. See where this goes. Instead, he goes off and he drinks with someone else. And the reason why is he doesn't want his personal sovereignty challenged. You see, he doesn't want his right to express his individual will challenged in any way, which is why we see uh, feminists in the U.S. just screaming with so much anger and anger about my body, my choice and all this kind of stuff. Because what they're seeing is they think it's an attack on individual will. And, and that's the big issue. And if they can't maintain that, if they can't sustain the, uh, if they can't come up with a, an appropriate rebuttal to my comment, which is that, but people choose evil things all the time. Why do you say my choice? What you're choosing could be evil. If they can't come up with a rebuttal to that objection, then they have no case and they know it. <laughs> so they walk away. They don't want to talk to you. They want to shout at you, but they don't want to talk to you. And I, and I think these kinds of arguments should lead where they lead. You know, we have to follow the logic of the argument. William, did they care to invite you again to the same party? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess I make myself a little bit obnoxious like that. I don't try to. I just really do want to hear what they have to say. Because I figure in a real debate, there's always a winner. Either you win because you made your case. And the other guy learns something or he wins, he made his case and you learn something, <laughs> but nobody loses. See, yes. but in Canada anyway, I don't know what it's like in Israel, but in Canada, oh, people don't want to get into that kind of situation. They don't want to discuss anything around the dinner table, which might upset anybody. It's terrible. I, I've gone to dinner parties. We don't go to many these days at my age, but you go to a dinner party. And I'll tell you, there's five, 10, 15, 20 topics you cannot raise at the table without expecting upset, outrage, even tears from somebody. So what's the consequence? The topics don't get discussed. 
When I was a young man, it wasn't that way. I can't remember anything that you couldn't raise at the table except outright rudeness and, you know, bad language or accusations of something that weren't true. But any topic was legitimate, except mm -hmm. maybe a disgusting topic when you're eating dinner, you know. Yes. But any political or theological or philosophical topic or moral topic was open around a family or a friend's uh, dinner table. It's not true now. People live in fear. Uh, it, it's probably the same where you live. People will not raise these questions because they don't know what the other people think. If they're thinking, or even if they're thinking at all, you know, well, you soon find out if you uh, dare to raise the question. I, I find it 81. Uh, I'm a little braver than I used to be. I don't care how they react. And I'm not rude on purpose, but I will raise these topics and I will say, you know, did you know? And so on. For example, at a dinner party, uh, well, a gathering for dinner a few weeks ago, someone raised the question of climate change. And I said, um, climate change? What are you talking about? Oh, you know, don't you know this and don't you know that? And I said, I said, would you agree that the, the big offender in the whole climate change debate is carbon dioxide? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, there's too much of it. And then I would say, how much? And, and they look at me and I say, well, I'm challenging you. What percentage of the Earth's atmospheric gases do you think is represented by carbon dioxide? Like, how much is there? If this is the enemy, the real enemy, you know what they say? It's unbelievable. Uh, 60%? No, no, I say, no, not 60. They say 40, 45%? I said, no, 70%? No. Well, then what is it? I say, it's less than it's, half a percent, right? Yeah, yeah 0.04%. Four wow. one hundredths, four one hundredths of the atmosphere uh, percentage of, of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Uh, that means it's it's just gone over four hundred parts per million, four hundred and twelve parts per million. They can't believe it, so they pull out their phones and they Google it to see if I'm correct because they don't believe me. And so then they go, "You're right. Here's what it says: point oh four percent." Hmm. So, you know, then if I tell them that there are many periods in the history of the world, and we know this from very sound geological records, climatological studies, whatever, there are many periods in the history of the world where warming, as we call it, uh, preceded the rise of carbon dioxide, not the other way around. The warming came first. And then, I guess, I don't know, because of the warmth, there was more carbon dioxide uh, on the Earth. And they don't believe that either. Uh, not not to mention that if you consider the, the most important standard to measure anything about life, for example, uh, human life, mankind's life, uh, since we have this so-called uh, crisis, which we don't, um, life has never been safer. And yes. people are, are not dying as much as they did before. They, they, you can't even see or measure the real effect. And in the last 50 years, we're talking about uh, uh, about less than half a degree of change in, in temperature. Well, even if so, they're correct, if any of your people are interested, I, I uh, posted a short essay on this um, topic on my website. It's called <laughs> Climate Change? Question mark. What are we to believe? I think you'll enjoy it. It's a summary of all the objections, very cleanly and unemotionally put. For anyone who's interested, um, and by the time you read it, you may say what a fellow I gave it to told me. He he was a con. He he got converted by the article, at least to become a doubter. And he said, "Boy," he said, "giving that article to a climate change fanatic is like giving a gin and tonic to an alcoholic." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no. uh, what he meant was it was a very effective piece. So I do encourage your people. You can also find it at Epoch Times. You just go to Epoch Times, and when it says search, put in my last name, and you'll see all my articles pop up, and the climate change one is is one of them. I, I think it's quite effective. Anyway, the only reason I mention that, besides my um, the fact that I'm proud of it, is that one of the things that the article quotes as actual research from the field here is that the World Bank actually came out with a critique of the uh, weather stations that are used around the world to measure climate. Now, you would think that Africa had some of the hottest temperatures in the world, right, being Africa. 
And the World Bank basically dismissed all measurements from Africa, which is a huge part of the earth, and basically said they were unreliable. Well, you know why. I mean, there's a meteorological station out in the jungle somewhere, or there's one that was put too close to the town and now it's surrounded by asphalt, or some guy who's supposed to go check it actually slept through that day, so it never got checked, so he plugged the number. I don't know. But the long and short of it is they said, all unreliable. You know, and then they say things like, well, the temperature here and the temperature there have to be average. I said, well, that's like saying if the temperature in the second story of your house is 28 degrees Celsius and the temperature on the bottom floor is 24, then the temperature of the house is 26, when in fact, none of it is. <laughs> none of it is. So yeah. it, it's a fib. <laughs> And they are not measuring the oceans and they don't take into consideration a lot of other elements of the complexity of the weather when yeah. they are measuring the heat. Um, I, I have one more question before uh, we open up for other questions, if you allow it. Um, yeah. if, you, if you meet a feminist who is uh, so eager and uh, so comfortable with the idea of aborting her child, assuming that you accept that it's murder, how do you go about um, changing her mind? assuming that she's willing to listen. I'm sorry, what was the last part of your question? If you speak to a feminist who is about to abort her child... Oh, right. Uh, yeah. How would you go about convincing her if she's willing to engage in a conversation? Uh, how, how will you explain to her that what she's about to do is immoral and basically a murder? Well, uh, you have to start slowly because when you start accusing people who think they're good people of murder... <clears throat> uh, You're not going to get a conversation. So I'm glad you asked the question because here's what I do. And unless someone can uh, show me otherwise, I think it's a, it's a uh, watertight uh, trap for those people. What I say is, can we agree that that woman walking over there is pregnant? You know, we're both, it's a mind experiment. And suppose we see a woman walking down the street and she's pregnant. Can we agree that she is pregnant? And the woman says, the woman who wants the right to abortion, she says, yes. I said, well, then could we agree that what she's carrying is alive? Uh, and she has to say yes, because we have no sense in which whatever she's carrying is dead. So I say, so she's carrying something alive. And this point I've got her saying, yes, she is. And I say, well, is it a human life or is it some other kind of life? Because you've already agreed it's a life. Is it a human life or some other life? Is it a snake, a turtle, a flamingo or whatever? Unless they're an idiot, they have to say it's a human life. So I've got them that far. And then I simply say, are you in favor of killing human life at any stage from conception forward? And they're stunned and stymied and they don't know what to answer. If they're honest people, they say, I'm okay with killing unborn children because I don't think they're human beings. I said, yeah, well, that's just a trick, you know, and that's a trick which is used by uh, politically and morally by all slave regimes in history. What do you mean? I said, yeah, I think the modern democracies are all slave regimes of a new kind. Why do you say that? I say that and, and I say, you, you are one of the slavers here. Why do you say that? I say, because you can't do what you want to do. You can't justify it unless you first define the life in the pregnant woman as a life not worth living or a non-human being. Now, in Canada's criminal code, I forget the section, I think it's, you know, 228 or something like that. There's an actual phrase that the um, fetus, which is what they call it, is not a human being until born alive. It's called the born alive rule. And until it has separated completely from its mother's body, alive. And then it's suddenly a human being, but not before that. And I said, do you know that that's what um, everyone did with slaves? White people did it with black slaves. Black people did it with their own black or Arabic slaves, whatever, because black people are, have, do not have clean hands when it comes to slavery, believe me. And so I say the modern democracies are slave regimes of a new kind, and that's why I call it the invisible holocaust in my book, because we are just like former slavers. They didn't see what was wrong with, with chattel slavery. They just didn't get it. In fact, if you read Thomas Sowell's fantastic article on this, he's, he's got an article 
called A Short History of Slavery. It's about 30 pages. Tells you everything you want to know about the history of slavery in the world. And uh, it's quite eye-opening and shocking to realize that everybody was doing it, including all, including all kinds of black races, and that the transatlantic uh, chattel slavery thing was a very late comer into a world which had been doing this for a few thousand years, if not more. And um, everybody was guilty of it, and everybody thought it was normal. Even Aristotle thought slavery was normal. But slaves are different than you and me. They don't mind being slaves, because if they really minded, they would run away, or they would slit their own throats and commit suicide. They don't care enough to do that, so it's, slavery is natural. Uh, and in the south of the U.S., this was the big argument. Slavery is natural. I know in the U.S. Uh, census of 1832, I think, when they did a census, they had 10,000 uh, people of color, they called them, who owned slaves of their own. And often a slave who bought his own freedom because, you know, in most slave systems, you can eventually buy your freedom. And the reason slave systems introduced that as a possibility was because they realized if, if it didn't, if it wasn't out there as a shining goal for the slave to save up his money, in ancient times it was called a pecunium, which was the amount of money they would pay a slave, very little, but if they were careful, they could save it up. And maybe 20 years down the road, they could buy their slavery and become a free man. But um, where was it? I can't remember where I was. But uh, the long and short of it is, uh, at the time, um, the first thing a black man who had been a slave would do once he bought his slavery, if he had enough money or went to work and made more money, was go buy himself a slave. Often these were domestic slaves, people that, you know, prepared the meals, washed the dishes, changed the baby's diapers and all that kind of stuff. But often they were people who worked their fields for them and that kind of thing. But they saw nothing wrong with it, is what I'm saying. It was the Christian states of the West who began to see slavery as something wrong. Particularly, as we all know, uh, Wilberforce in Britain took him two decades to persuade everybody. You know, I once was blind, but now I see was uh, how his famous, the famous song goes. Uh, and they finally got persuaded. And then the Christian democracies of the West became the biggest anti-slaver force in the world. They were stopping ships that were crossing the Atlantic, ships from uh, North Africa, ships from Spain, ships from Portugal. And they would often stop the ships if they were slave ships. They would free the slaves and hang the captain right on the deck and throw, throw them overboard because he committed an international offense. So there were a lot of policing going on of a slave world, which was still continuing, but not by the Christian democracies, who, which are owed a great deal for bringing this moral um, reversal about. So the question to my, to the woman that I'm doing this argument on abortion is, are you ever gonna see that you have a slave attitude towards your own child? you have accepted the idea that your own child is a non-human being. Why is that true? Since we have all the data, we have all the genetics, we have the x-rays and the ultrasounds, we can see the damn thing smiling in there, come on, sucking its thumb. And you don't think it's a human being? Nothing okay. explains this blindness and this deafness of an, millions of people, millions of people. In the US, under Roe versus Wade, get this, Six, 60 million children were obliterated uh, by people who thought it was morally and legally justified. It's, it's, exact, it's an exact mirroring of 60 million slaves being transported, transported because it was morally and legally justified. They don't see it. But the question is, is there going to be a Wilberforce down the road who will bring this to public attention? I think it's come to public attention which is part of the reason Roe versus Wade got reversed, besides the fact that it was a stupid law to begin with, uh, because of technology. So we now know about the genetics. We can, put, we can put needles into the womb of a pregnant woman, and we can draw blood from a live human being child, and we can do all the testing. We can even do an operation on an unborn child. And listen to this, in my province where I live, there's a civil law and there's criminal law. Under the criminal law, Abortion, there's no law on abortion in Canada. In, in Canada, if you can get a doctor to do it, you can abort a child till the last moment before natural birth. And I don't know if it's done, but I think it has been done. And it was done in the U.S. for many years before they came out against it. It was called partial birth abortion. 
This was a terrible thing done under the aegis of individual liberty again and my choice, my body, where the woman had waited too long. They couldn't do a regular abortion because they couldn't get the child out uh, of a, an unripe womb. So what they would do is what they call char partial birth abortion to avoid legal charges and being arrested for murder. They would turn the baby around in the womb and pull it out by the feet. So here the abortionist is pulling his little feet out and then these legs and then this little bum and then the body of the child, but the head of the child was too big to pass an unripe cervix easily. And this is true, what I'm telling you. So he takes a pair of special, special scissors and he jams it into the back of the skull of the unborn child. And then he puts a, a tube in there and he sucks out the brain. Once he sucks the brain out, the skull collapses and the baby's dead. So legally speaking, he cannot be charged with murder because all he's doing is extracting a dead child from its own mother. Now, there, I think the last time I looked, but there was a record of this published in, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have the newspaper or the record, but it's there if you look for it. Something like 10,000 partial birth abortions were performed in the U.S. before President Clinton came out against it and I think banned it or tried to ban it. And we don't even know if it's completely banned or if it's still done you know, secretly by some of these clinics. Now, that's a terrible story. Uh, the case I'm trying to make, the philosophical and moral case, is that it's only permitted because of the hegemony of the will, the sovereignty of the individual will, both of the woman who wants it done to her and of the abortionist who thinks he has a right to do it. See? Um, yeah. So that's a terrible story, and maybe we would wrap it up before I get accused of telling too many terrible stories. Yeah. Uh, can you allow maybe one or two questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, guys, uh, if any of you have a question, uh, now would be a good time. Don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> Sneer. Alexander, anyone? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, William. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's uh, not always uh, easy to come up with a question on the spot. No, I, I think Michael would like to ask a question. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you for yes. uh, being with us and uh, speaking with us. Um, I would like to know how do you see the technology uh, if it's more good than bad for for the family. Uh, Cell and for the for for us the the men and the women uh, at what a general. Did you say the psychology? Technology. No. no technology. Way. I see. Oh boy, that's that's a whole whole topic, as you know. And I don't know a lot about it except to say that I think the invention of the pill, the birth control pill has resulted in, I'm not going to say caused, <laughs> because a pill doesn't do anything unless you use it, <clears throat> but the pill, the um, invention of the birth control pill and all the other things which we now have, for example, we have abortion pills, um, has radically changed um, human life to the extent that the Western democracies, for example, I think it's true of all of them, have been shrinking over time in terms of their natural population. Uh, this is another topic which I deal with in a book called The Trouble with Canada Still. There's an important chapter in there on um, immigration and all that sort of thing. Because like in the case of Canada, uh, the women who really should have 2.1 children each in order to just maintain a population are having, I think, 1.4 children for the last 35 years. In other words, our natural population has been shrinking. And the Princeton Center for Population Studies, I believe that's what it's called. You can look for yourself. 20 years ago, they came out with an alarming statement and basically said that countries like Italy, which at the time had, I don't know, 55 million citizens, um, by the year 2080, whatever, would have 20 million fewer citizens than they do today. So when that happens, and most of this is because they're discovering the pill. They're, they're learning that they can fornicate, so to speak, have sex, enjoy themselves, 
uh, I mean, men love this. I mean, I guess women like the protection uh, from marauding men that the pill gives them. But, and I'm sure some of them enjoy the worry-free sex too. I know they do. Uh, but for men, it was just such a boon. I mean, um, I have I have two sons and three daughters, and my sons tell me it's just a, a feast of sex out there in university. For example, it's like um, something I never saw when I was a young man at university. We had to be very careful in every way, <clears throat> and um, if you got a woman pregnant, you were basically uh, dialing up a very different kind of life for yourself because honor. Honor was going to require you to marry her, so you tended to stay away from, I guess, what you call unprotected sex. It wasn't easy to come by, and girls were very frightened of becoming pregnant. Suddenly, we have girls acting like men. We have girls picking men up almost as frequently as men pick girls up. I would say not as frequently yet, but it has happened. Uh, it does happen. So that has changed the entire psychology, and it's all due to technology. To answer your question, and then of course, uh, you know, I didn't finish my story about the uh, uh, abortion in Ontario. I'm sorry, and I hope the individual who asked the question doesn't mind me switching tracks here. But this is a bizarre reality of my own province: the conflict between uh, criminal law and civil law. In criminal law, you will go to jail for murder if you kill a child. But not if you kill it in the womb. However, if you if you know from ultrasounds, whatever, that the child needs surgery, it's possible to do the surgery while the child's in the womb. So what the surgeon does is he makes an incision on the pregnant woman's belly. He takes the child out while it's still attached to the umbilical cord and all that, and he lays it on on the cloth on her belly, and he performs the surgery on the child. While it's outside the womb, now while it's outside the womb, it's deemed a human being. Legally, this child is a human being in the operating room, lying on top of its mother's belly. But then, when he puts it back in the womb and sews her up again, it disappears as a human being. That human being is gone until it's wow. born alive. Now that's wow. true, and that's a conflict between the civil law and the criminal law in Canada, which has led to that bizarre situation. So, if the doctors say at the time. Decided to strangle the child,、uh, he would go to jail for murder. But if you waited until he pulled it out or went inside with his whatever saline solutions and so on, killed it in the womb, he's scot free. That's insane.、Uh, earlier about what you said about the pills, I see a very interesting connection. The pills、uh, is、okay. like the pills. The the the. the, the You know, pills for、uh, sexual uh, pleasure. What、well, a pill! I'm sorry, you said pill. Yeah, a, a yeah. pill in English. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's causing this、uh, hypersexuality, which will、yes. uh, lead to very problematic relationship. Relationship, if anything, and eventually the men will be infant infantilized、uh, instead of maturing and taking responsibility as the、um, provider of the family, the care of the family. And in the end of the of this、uh, charade. You will find women at the age of forty、uh, receiving a cat. Yeah, well, you know, that, what, that's what, what I see in Tel Aviv. What you say is true. Yeah. yeah, a lot of、what、sexual partners, and eventually you are left alone, broken-hearted, and you、with、have、no、a lot of cats with, with, with no children. No children, but a lot of cats. Yeah. Yeah.、Uh, well, it's 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 happening everywhere, and. No one's doing anything about it. I shouldn't say no one. Some states, like the province of Quebec, they call themselves a different country or nation. They can tell, call themselves what they want, but constitutionally, they are a province of Canada,、uh, and they're primarily French-speaking citizens there. And they got very alarmed about what a man named Ben Wattenberg, an American writer, in a book written in the late '80s, early '90s, called "The Birth Dearth." So the birth dearth、uh, was a very good book. I recommend it, in which he predicted what we're going going through today, which is the shrinking populations. Well, the Quebecers got very upset about that, and they thought we we got to do something about this. So, so they began by、uh, paying money for a first child, second child, third child, and so on. And it goes up from like five thousand. I'm I'm guessing now, but it's something like five thousand dollars 
tax credit for your first child, 7,500 for the second one, 10,000 for the third and so on. But um, they actually had some success in, in uh, I'm gonna say inducing uh, women to stay home and have children and reap the tax benefits instead of um, going out to work and shrinking the, the size of their possible families. Now there's, I've got a lot of uh, suggestions about what states can do to encourage family development, but they're not doing it. And so the real question is, when are they going to do it? Well, they don't want to, here's the thing, they don't want to do it without coming out against the hegemony of the individual will. They don't want to say, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be having so much sex irresponsibly. You shouldn't be whatever, you see. And they need to tie the men back in, in terms of responsibility for their behavior. <clears throat> for example, in Canada, if a woman gets pregnant, she decides whether she wants an abortion or not. You have no say as a man. You can't say, I don't want to abort. This is my child. I don't want to abort it. You have no say. The woman has complete say about what she wants to do with her child. It's not your child. Uh, however, if she decides to keep the child, she can That's force you to pay child support until the child is 18. <laughs> so what's the reaction of young men to that? The reaction of young men to that is to hell with you. <laughs> And to hell with marriage and to hell with having children. I'm not going anywhere near that. Thank you. Take your damn pill so we can have more sex. You know, that kind of thing. So it a, divides the men from any meaning they had or responsibility they felt for the women they were, I'm going to say, making love with. Because I hate the phrase having sex. It sounds like you're having a bowel movement or you're, have, or you're having dinner. <laughs> You yes. know, whatever, having, having something, having is a possessive verb in English and any other language too, I think. So making love is very different from having sex. But this pill has converted a lot of lovemaking eventualities into practical having sex eventualities. And even the women are doing it. Women are doing it. My boys tell me a lot of the young women are behaving like men have always behaved. We used to say it's a vulgar expression. We used to say slam, bam, thank you. You, ma'am, or you know, that kind of thing, like bye bye after the sex. And it reminds me even of the famous European European um, uh, duke or whatever. He had some kind of aristocratic title. And he was being interviewed on European TV because he was such a handsome man and so wealthy, and women were just falling all over him. But he liked to pay very high class prostitutes. And so he was on the show, and everybody knew this. And so this interviewer said, you're so handsome. You're so um, dignified. You have such a station in life. Why do you play, pay women for sex? And there was a silence. And then he looked at her and he said, I'm not paying them for sex. I'm paying them to go away after the sex. <laughs> so, yeah. That was I his was, answer. And that's, a lot of men that's a lot of men no. and women are doing today. I want yes. the sex. I don't want anything to do with you after that. I, I think that there is also a connection between what you just described uh, with how dangerous it is for you know the the the, the control that the women have on on the baby and the ability to squeeze the man and to make him pay and all the rest of it. I wonder if it's adding to the numbers of gay people who are uh, wishing to enjoy sex without consequences. I think it's a contributing factor. There's a chapter in my book, The Great Divide, which Uh, point to a theory called attachment theory and attachment theory is rooted on real studies in the reality that some young men and some young women have difficulty attaching through love to other human beings and in the, in the case of the men the um, psychological dynamic goes something like this the men have a alien and distant and An emotionally remote father but a smothering mother who babies them right through their teenage life wants them to live at home I mean the whole thing and some of these men a large percentage of them uh, have this psychological situation in their lives they become homosexual and the idea of the therapist who preaches attachment theory and I think there's something to it is that they're looking they want to replace the missing male in their lives and This is actually homosexual sex is actually a call for male love the male love they didn't have all through their young life and the reverse is true for the lesbian women 
they had a distant, remote, unemotional mother and a smothering, overly attentive father. Uh, so they got the father love, but they didn't get the mother love. So they go lesbian to get it. Well, that sounds a bit simplistic, but I think there's theoretical support for it. If anybody's interested in following some of the fine researchers and writers on what's called attachment theory. And I think I better go have my yeah. dinner now or I'm going to be unattached. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to add that I think that if you remove the welfare, then you're going to solve some of those problems with the missing father in the family. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's uh, William, uh, thank you very much for your time and, and your incredible presentation. As usual, I would like to know if next Wednesday you can come again, maybe for, uh, to speak about uh, uh, universals and relativism. Or yes, maybe you... Yes, yeah, so the same time, Wednesday? Same time, PM, Wednesday, two o'clock. I really enjoy the company of you and your people. And obviously, I enjoy <laughs> talking about what interests me. And at my age and stage in life, I don't get a lot of people to share these ideas with. So it's a pleasure for me. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone here. Uh, I'm going to send you the video in uh, private so you can put it in your YouTube channel. And I put in the main group uh, your uh, web page and some information so people can Thank find you. out. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, sir. See you next Bye week. For... Thank you very much. Bye-bye.